Welcome back, Mr. Clark's back. Time to take a look at 18.3. This section will kind of take us through some of the just ramifications of the ongoing expansion of the Latino population in the United States after World War II. The population that continues to expand and grow in our country today. We'll look at some of the significant leaders and methods they use to achieve quality in political rights for Latinos. We'll evaluate the means by which Native Americans sought to expand their rights as Native Americans continue to be one of those groups that you know, really were treated as second class citizens. We'll look at the expansion of the rights of consumers as well as the uh, disabled or mentally or physically handicapped. Question one, why did the U.S. government change its stance towards the Brasirios between the 1940s and the 1950s? Well, the Brasirios were needed to keep the agricultural industry moving forward during World War II when we had many of our men on the battlefields of World War II. However, when the soldier came back from Europe, the Brasirios were no longer welcome. So basically they exploited them, used them, paid them poorly, and then once the war was over, then they didn't really necessarily want to continue to see them to be employed on uh, the fields and farms across the, the South and Western United States. Two, what events and trends led Latino Americans to leave their home countries and come to the United States in the first place? Many of their homelands experienced rising populations and declining job opportunities. Latino Americans came to the United States for economic opportunities. They also came to escape, in some cases, harsh governments or dictatorships in their home countries that oppressed the citizens. Three, what are people whose family origins are Spanish or are from Spanish speaking regions of Latin America called? Latinos or Latin Americans or Hispanics or Hispanic Americans? You can see those uh, phrases used or terminologies used interchangeably very often. Four, the Immigration and Nationality Act was passed in 1965 and it eliminated quotas for immigrants. This allowed more Latin American immigrants to come into the United States. What other events in the United States may have led to the passage of this law? Well, the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s caused people to rethink their stance on inequality and prejudice. Many people in the United States began to believe in equal opportunities for all. Next, we'll start looking at some individuals and organizations that fought for the rights of Latin Americans. Okay, number five, and you see an imagery, imagery there of Hector Garcia. Hector Garcia, what did he do? He was a Latino World War II veteran. He established the American GI Forum to battle discrimination against Latin Americans. Perhaps uh, more famous than Hector Garcia would be Cesar Chavez, who was the most significant Latino activist. He in particular fought for the rights of uh, laborers, a lot of your migrants who had come in here into the United States to work on the farms in California and southwestern United States, were paid very poorly, well below minimum wage, and you know, very hot and difficult conditions often in the summer months, and they were paid very poorly, much less than their uh, you know, white citizen uh, counterparts. Seven, what are mi migrant farm workers? These are farm workers who move from farm to farm or state to state looking for work. What organization did Cesar Chavez help establish? The UFW the United Farm Workers, who fought for the fair treatment of farm workers. And the UFW, obviously, today uh, employs not just Latino Americans, but anybody who works in that field. How was Cesar Chavez influenced by Dr. King, Martin Luther King, and the Civil Rights Movement? Like MLK, Chavez fought for the rights of people who had been repeatedly exploited and abused. He was committed to nonviolent tactics such as strikes and boycotts. Speaking of boycotts, number 10, how is the grape boycott and the grape, not great, grape boycott a good example of Chavez's commitment to the strategy? 
Chavez organized a nonviolent boycott across the nation of California grapes. California, California eventually gave in and recognized the UFW's right to represent grape farm workers. Next, take a moment to kind of take in the mural that's uh, on the screen. Analyzing mural shown in Latino organization Fight for Rights. We use this information from the mural to make an inference about at least two things that are important to the Chicano heritage. Take a good look there. And there's more than two. Religion is obviously an important part of all Latin Americans, many of whom are Catholic. This communicates this by depicting the First Communion, none to church there in the background. Also shows the importance of hard work to Chicano by showing migrant workers and construction workers who are working really hard. Also see the group of people together, kind of sticking together in the togetherness. Okay, what do you see that's similar and different between the Chicano movement as well as the Harlem Renaissance that we had studied previously? Both movements allowed ethnic groups to understand and celebrate their heritage and identity. The movements took different forms, however. The Harlem Renaissance was characterized by literature and music, while the Chicano movement encouraged schools to teach about Latino heritage and also included nonviolent protests to kind of bring about rights. Next, we'll take a little look here at Native Americans and Asian Americans. Okay, 13, what were the goals of the Native American protests at Alcatraz and Wounded Knee? First of all, Alcatraz is located in San Francisco. Protests were largely symbolic. The Native Americans wanted to increase awareness of the abuses and injustices they had experienced and to demonstrate their claim to lands they had lost. And keep in mind, during this period of time in the 1960s forward, eventually we're moving towards more recognition, I guess, of some of the land that might have been stolen from Native Americans you know, over the course of their, their centuries of America being here in North America. And we try and make retribution for that. Obviously, the Native Americans did not truly expect to return to their old way of life through these protests, but they did want to receive some form of recognition for the idea that they were wronged at one point in time in history. Next, we're going to look at a quote from D. Brown's influential book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. What's the central idea based on the quote? Only occasionally was the voice of the Indian heard, and then more often than not, it was recorded by the pen of a white man, meaning that it's going to come from a white man's perspective opposed to that of a Native American. The Indian was the dark menace of myths, and even he had known, even if he had known how to write in English, where would have he found a printer or a publisher to put forth their book? So Brown pointed out the lack of Native American representation in history had contributed to the lack of awareness of things that Native Americans had endured and obstacles that they had to overcome to achieve equal rights. Fifteen, compare and contrast the goals of Japanese American Citizens League and the American Indian Movement. Uh, both groups try to fight against unjust treatment and prejudice against ethnic groups. The American Indian Movement fought to regain Indian land and raise awareness through militant protest, while the Japanese American Citizens League wanted reparations from Japanese internment during World War II. And as we know, based on our previous studies of the Japanese internment camps, we know that the, the reparations for the Japanese would come but not until the 1980s, more than four decades after they had been interned in camps in America. Next, we're going to look at some of the issues of citizens getting additional rights, consumers and disabled. Who is Ralph Nader? Well, there's a more contemporary photo on the left of Nader and the photo from the 1960s on the right. Nader, of course, uh, famous for, in contemporary times, running for the presidency on the Green Party ticket multiple times, including in the 2000 presidential election, where he received just enough votes to perhaps pull votes away from Al Gore, allowing George W. Bush to win the presidency in 2000. You see the iconic book, one that's still widely uh, recognized today, is kind of being the turning point in the consumer protections movement. 
throughout the 1960s, unsafe at any speed. This book from the consumer advocate and attorney, Ralph Nader, criticized automakers in 1965 of being more concerned about style and profit than safety for the consumers. In the years since, he continued to fight for the rights of Americans, focusing on consumer safety. He really spearheaded protecting the environment and twice a candidate on the Green Party ticket for the presidency of the United States. And then his book from 1965 led to the uh, National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act of 1966. This set safety standards for cars and highways and established the, tra the Traffic Safety Administration to enforce these laws. What act did President Nixon propose to help establish workplace and safety regulations? OSHA or Occupational Safety and Health Administration? Most places of business, including uh, Metuchen High School and our faculty uh, room, have a poster or pamphlets of you know, OSHA and standards and things like that for staff members to take a look at. This is where our rights come from, at least in the workplace. Nineteen, if Franklin Roosevelt had shown his disability openly, do you think the rights for people with disabilities would have been achieved earlier? Obviously, this is an opinion. As you know, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, with cooperation from the media, was able to hide the fact that he had very little use of his legs during his presidency. He wasn't often filmed and it was never publicized. Uh, you know, him getting helped in and out of cars or chairs or things like that. It may have been harder for Roosevelt to govern effectively and, be, and he might not have been elected to four terms if he had shown his disability openly. Unfortunately, some people would not have treated him fairly. However, had he been successful, having a president with a disability probably would have improved visibility and the rights for people with disabilities uh, sooner in history. Twenty, what did President Kennedy's sister Eunice Shriver establish? A Special Olympics, you're probably familiar with this, for physically and mentally handicapped people to compete in athletic events. And then finally, a lesser reflection question, how is the expanding... Hispanic American population going to impact the country moving forward. A greater voice within society, obviously a huge voting block within the country and impacting politics and elections. We've also had the Bilingual Education Act, which provides uh, more rights for those who are, you know, are not English as a first language citizens. That'll conclude our discussion for today. Hopefully you enjoyed our lesson. And until next time, Mr. Clark is out.